currently is called father and son a working name we have a father and son podcast yeah we might have to end up sticking with that yeah okay assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh brothers and sisters in islam welcome back to father and son podcast we haven't yet decided a name okay that is a situation that we are currently in we haven't decided a name for this podcast okay now i just want to put a clarification out on this podcast uh this is not my podcast which is called the majlis on my channel okay a lot of people were getting that confused you can watch that as well and this is a podcast that will be on my father's channel and it's a father and son podcast so you'll see me on every episode here inshallah ta'ala I'm sure you're very grateful for that right um okay so beginning let's let's start off this uh podcast by discussing uh your recent trip to turkey you recently went to turkey um and you were a tour guide if i can call it like a history guide on the trip how did you find um how did you find that trip i think it's your first time doing that in turkey right Yeah, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Absolutely that was an uh, amazing experience. I went with a group of people from the UK. Mm-hmm. And um, I was there as a history guide. In other words, uh, explaining the history of the Ottomans as we went along on the trip. So we went from uh, place to place, city to city, explaining the history of uh, Ottoman monuments, tombs, sultans mm-hmm. and the graves. and um, possibly pre-ottoman uh, history as well at the same time because we came across a lot of roman byzantine history as well yeah so it was a fascinating trip so uh, inshallah we were, we will be doing more of these tours in the future okay to turkey to spain to morocco possibly and we will be teaching history on the ground as they say you know reading history is one thing but actually looking at history experiencing it in person touching it feeling it internalizing it in that way is absolutely a different experience completely mm-hmm. different experience right yeah that's why it was a fascinating experience for myself as well even though i had read about this history multiple times but being there in person to explain the history at the the very monuments and um you know at the the tombs of these great sultans explaining their history and uh, shedding light upon the deeds it was a very different experience mm-hmm. it was a very very spiritually uplifting experience so alhamdulillah it was a very uh, interesting uh, journey i think it's interesting because mm-hmm. currently we have the uh, the process of the turkish turkish elections going on Yeah. right mm-hmm. so you have erdogan on one, uh, on one side and then you have this other guy yeah. on the other side who mm. um i think comes across as um a secularist yeah yeah a, l- a lot of people are making this uh, this distinction between the two candidates two major candidates erdogan represents the islamists or the islamic um element and uh, the other person who was in opposition to Erdogan represents the Kemalist secularist people who yeah. who represent secularism or more kind of um, leaning towards secularism kind of people i think so, what's quite strange about yeah. turkey the situation in turkey is that when you go there even though many of the people unfortunately you do find many people mm-hmm. um come across as quite irreligious Yeah. Right. I think I I do think that's a fair statement to make. Mm-hmm. Um you do find religious people of course. I'm not saying that there's no religious people in Turkey. Mm. You do find religious people, but mm. for the most part like when I went to Istanbul, you know, when we went like some months back, um I found that the the Turkish people, if I was to generalize them, I would make a generalization that most of them don't come across as religious very religious people yeah it depends right? where you are it, yeah it, there are certain so areas we were in the city, city i think in the tourist areas yeah. maybe that's why yeah. um but the thing the, the the point that i wanted to make is even though that sentiment may come across to some people maybe some of the people listening at home they've felt exactly the same way i still feel like there's this unavoidable history in istanbul that kind of 
divides s- the two groups and it slaps you in the in your face wherever you turn right. it's like the buildings do you know mm. what i mean yeah Hagia sophia when you go it's like yeah. it's unavoidable for turkish people it's unavoidable mm. uh, uh for them to like to see that know, uh, all of this that contrast stuff. you're talking about the contrast what i mean is like even for people who want to bring mm. the secularist idea and the, the, mm. that ideology in, in play and stuff like that and they want to kind of try and erase islam from the picture or like you know s- try and attempt to subdue it they how can you do that in a place like istanbul like or in a place like turkey right. where the islamic history is so rich yeah you know it's very difficult to do yeah do you absolutely. know what i mean absolutely i mean look turkey is a very unique case if you go back to spain for example okay even the catholics as hostile as they were when these catholic monarchs in 1492 when they took the last stronghold of the muslims called granada from the muslims they went on uh how can i put it a cultural genocide mm-hmm. okay they 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 committed a cultural genocide they started to completely remove any traces of islam from not only granada that was taken recently but even other lands where muslims existed in large numbers yeah, just like yeah. seville right yeah. um and valencia mm-hmm. also okay so large muslim populations were there mm-hmm. and these catholic monarchs carried out a systematic genocide not only a physical genocide but a cultural genocide yeah they burnt millions of books they destroyed many monuments mm-hmm. they simply could not erase the history of islam from spain because there was so much there and, that's and the your point. point stands yeah. but we didn't have a situation like that in turkey in turkey what we had was a break from the tradition let's say mm-hmm. i mean the, the traditional history of turkey is very rich it started with the ottomans the rise of the ottomans we will discuss that very quickly yeah uh, briefly yeah. so that our viewers can actually appreciate what we're dealing with mm-hmm. right turkey became turkey due to the ottoman um, uh, contribution mm-hmm. historically speaking right of course Firstly, yeah. let's talk about the land mass of turkey what is turkey today yeah turkey is a huge country and majority of the land mass or let's say geographically speaking what we call turkey today is predominantly anatolia mm-hmm. it's also called asia minor mm-hmm. because it's like a mini continent it's a huge territory yeah and guess what musa this was roman territory yes as late as the the 11th century so when 1071 we... mm-hmm. was the year when the romans were defeated in a battle called the battle of manzikert mm-hmm. manzikert okay. okay and the seljuks they defeated the romans mm-hmm. sultan alp arsalan mm-hmm. was the uh, the seljuk ruler at the time yes and he had captured the roman emperor in battle mm-hmm. well wow. <laughs> this was the second time in roman history yeah. when the emperor was caught okay. was captured on the battlefield so what happened having to him? lost so he was humiliated there are reports that sultan al-parsalan actually humiliated him right and there are other reports that what type after, of humiliation are we for example he he, he he made him basically uh, become a footstool something like that oh, okay. if i'm if i'm if i'm not mistaken in this i i read about it a long time ago right yeah yeah okay and uh, we see similar situation with shapur you know this is the 3rd century ce yeah. when the roman emperor uh, valerian is uh, that the one who uh, who was caught the first time yeah. in battle and was, was he captured f- was he forced to uh, yeah drink gold or something uh, no 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 who's that th- that was the the, the last abbasid caliph oh, oh my god okay, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah. the the mongols were stuffing coins in his mouth oh my god and telling him i mean the legend goes this is how Subhan. this has been reported but we don't know how true that is because there are different reports of him being killed yeah. or the method used to kill him mm. the last abbasid caliph al mustasim mm. in 1258 when the mongols took the city of baghdad and they devastated the city completely wiped it out okay and yeah. there are reports that when they found the caliph the last abbasid caliph al mustasim billah Uh, there are reports that they basically found him with his treasure mm-hmm. and oh they locked him up with his treasure and told told him to eat this 
mm-hmm. what you did not spend to to defeat us yes, basically yes, yes. Yeah, right yeah. there are other reports that he was rolled in a carpet and kicked to death uh, a mongol mm-hmm. way of killing uh, the elite basically right that would take that's, a, that's a different topic very long so time we, yeah so we're going back to yeah. manzikert the battle of manzikert took place in 1071 when the roman emperor was actually uh, his name was uh, romanos okay? okay he was caught on the battlefield and humiliated this was the second time in roman history when this happened okay. as a result of this battle mm-hmm. the romans completely lost control eventually mm-hmm. completely lost control of uh, this territory called anatolia okay which was roman territory and we when we're talking about romans we're talking about uh, the byzantine Christ- christian byzantine romans yeah. this is a very interesting point which i came across one of our guides who was with us brother tarik mm-hmm. uh, who was on this trip and he mentioned something very interesting mm-hmm. he said this term roman has been removed from history systematically mm-hmm. when it comes to eastern roman empire yeah 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 because for some reason europeans don't want to accept that the romans were defeated by the muslims yes okay even the romans were defeated many times by the muslims earlier but this was such a devastating de- defeat that it it eventually resulted in the taking of the city of constantinople itself mm-hmm. uh, the the capital of the roman eastern uh, eastern roman empire okay yes. so the term roman was replaced by the term byzantines i don't know which book i was reading but mm-hmm. they were mentioning that mm-hmm. the byzantines didn't see themselves as byzantines Right. They, they actually them, so as Romans. Romans. Yeah. They always yeah. took pride in calling themselves the Romans. Yes. It's just like the Mughals yes. today. Yeah. The Mughals basically never to my knowledge called themselves Mughals mm-hmm. uh until the 19th century. What were they calling? It was in the 19th century when the Mughals started to refer to themselves as Mughals because the British had used this term conveni- conveniently to describe the Mughals. The Mughals called themselves or refer to themselves as the timurids mm. timuri yeah. okay the the house of timur yes. timur the famous Ooh. conqueror from central asia and the moguls were descendants who was related to uh, the to the mongols yeah right? indirectly yeah. he had he had some link to the mongols yes right yes. so so the battle of manzikert des- decided as to what, what will happen to this territory mm-hmm. in subsequent decades and when was that again 1071 1071 yeah this is when turkic people started to move from central asia in to this new territory conquered by the seljuks seljuks themselves were turkic yeah or they were from the turkic stock yeah from central asia they were originally from central asia so they started to move into um this territory new territory mm-hmm. and then uh the seljuks remained in power for nearly you can say 200 years if not exactly 200 years yes. for nearly 200 in the year 1248 or 1244 uh, a battle took place between the seljuks and the mongols the mongols came in invading this territory and they defeated the seljuks in a battle okay mm-hmm. and this battle basically weakened the seljuk center Seljuks okay. are ruling all of this territory from Konya. Yeah. Okay. Konya was the capital. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh where Jalaluddin Rumi, Maulana Jal- Jalaluddin Rumi is buried. Okay. Okay. So Konya was the capital of the Seljuks. The Se- Seljuks lost their power. As a result of this weakening of power, many Turkic principalities who paid homage to the Seljuks uh, as they overlords or um, rulers above them they started to declare independence okay and they came to be known as beyliks oh yes beyliks okay. beyliks were basically small turkic or turkish principalities ruled by turks who came originally from central asia okay so there were many beyliks throughout asia minor or what we call today as anatolia mm-hmm. the the land mass of turkey okay One of those beyliks in the north western part of Anatolia was the Osmanli mm-hmm. beylik okay the Ottoman in other words the Ottoman beylik it was mm-hmm. a small principality in the the north western uh, part of Anatolia and this was kind of a buffer zone 
between the Romans, the Byzantines, and the rest of the Turkic uh, Beyliks. Okay. Right? So these people, because they were ruling these marshlands or the borderland between the Romans and uh, the, the Turkish principalities, they started to fight the Romans and they started to take territory from the Romans and that gave them a lot of confidence, a lot of credibility. They became the Mujahideen. They mm -hmm. became the champions of Islam, in particular Sunni Islam. Okay. So that gave them a lot of credibility. And these are the Beliks? These, uh, these are the Ottomans. the Ottomans. I'm talking about the Ottomans, the, uh, the children of Uthman, Sultan Uthman himself yes. and his children, his descendants. They became more and more influential and powerful and they because, go back of, to... because of their wars with the Romans, the Byzantines, who were far more superior militarily than these Turkic Beyliks. Okay. Okay. Hmm. So, so this is how Ottomans came about. Okay. So when we talk about Turkey today, mm -hmm. Turkey didn't come from a vacuum. Okay. There's a lot of history. There's a lot of background work, mm -hmm. which Muslims did. Uh, for nearly a thousand years. Yeah, yeah. So as you said, this this can't be just wiped out in one yeah. one one stroke. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, like Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, when he came to power in the early 20th century, he tried to remove a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. Okay. He he changed the adhan. He changed the alphabets. Okay. Um, and he also changed uh, many things. He changed the dress code. He tried to change the culture. A lot of things. What and, is the actual position on him? That's a very good question. Uh, what's, what's the, do, it do, depends. Is he, is he viewed as a Muslim? Um, many people using his writings and his views, they, they, they doubt his Islam, basically. His Islam completely. And okay. there are others who insist that he's, he was a Muslim, but he was trying to modernize the Muslims of Turkey. Okay. So there are different views on him. Okay. Uh, but looking at his profile, okay, I, I don't think he cared much about Islam. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's my personal opinion. People can disagree is that with that. Is that a controversial thing to say? Uh, in Turkey, it may be say, controversial well, to say Why that. is it yeah. controversial if it's... In Turkey, he's if, con if, if, if it's in Turkey <laughs> is con he's constitutionally protected. You cannot insult Mustafa Kemal Atatürk. Okay. He's literally called the Atatürk. His name was Mustafa Kemal. He's mm -hmm. called Atatürk, which literally means the father of Turks. Of the Turks, yeah. The father of the Turks, right? Yeah, yeah. So he's the founding father of modern Turks. Turkish state, mm -hmm. right? So that's why constitutionally, he, his his legacy and his prestige and his uh, his name is protected. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So it is not constitutionally uh, feasible to insult him or criticize him or even highlight his his controversies. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So so that's why Erdogan's battle is not only against uh, corruption. Yeah, okay. yeah. It's also against uh, people who who are very adamant in keeping the legacy of Mustafa Kemal Atatürk alive, and they want to remain secular. They want to have as little Islam as possible, socially speaking, mm -hmm. in Turkey. So Erdogan is trying to, you know, revive some sort of Islamic legacy. He's trying to br bring back appreciation for Ottomans. Mm -hmm. He has done a lot of things. He has opened up monuments. He even made Hagia Sophia um, or reinitiated it as a mosque, as a masjid, which it was After before, before 1930s yeah. uh, when Mustafa Kemal Atatürk made it into a museum. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. So he did a, lo a lot of these things. So Ottoman history is absolutely fascinating. I mean, well, yes. I don't know why we're discussing politics, Turkish politics. but it's, I mean, it's, I wanted to bring a current linked. events yeah. Uh, yeah. Kind yeah. of perspective to it yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I I was completely blown away by by the sultans and the history and mm -hmm. you know when you are on the ground looking at um, uh, the sultans and the sacrifices and and looking at what they had created for Muslims, mm -hmm. they did a great service to Islam and Muslims. Did you leave Istanbul when you went? Did we? Sorry. Did you leave Istanbul or you stayed in Istanbul? No, no, we stayed in Istanbul. For a okay. couple of nights, and uh, as in, we, as in, did you go outside of it? Uh, yeah, we did. Uh, we started with Iznik. Okay. Uh, classical Nicaea. Iznik is where the art comes from, right? Uh, which art? You know the famous Turkish the mosaic. Yeah, yeah. Oh no, I don't know about the Turkish art, uh, but 
You know, like art. the mosaic art, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. It's 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 mainly. I think it comes Eastern from Eastern Roman. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's mainly Eastern Roman. Uh, you know, like the flowers. You know the you know the flowers on the Ottoman plates and stuff like no, that. No, that's different. You're talking about tiles and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. I think that comes from blue tiles, blue tiles, yeah. and okay, I don't know about that. I think this is okay. Okay, I'm pretty sure. So so now, Iznik was basically. Uh, Nicaea, the city of Nicaea, where the famous Council of Nicaea took place. I made a video about yeah. uh, this church. Okay, okay. yeah. See, so so Iznik is the place of this this art tile work. So if uh, you right, yeah. Let's see. So Iznik was the city of Nicaea. Oh, oh really? Speaking. Okay. Yeah, that's where the Council of Nicaea, the famous Council of Nicaea, took place in the year 325 CE and I actually visited the place I uploaded a video on my channel mm -hmm. okay uh, there is a church in Iznik which is uh, which was built in the 4th century when Emperor Constantine was uh, around and um, it is claimed some people believe that that is the church where the Council of Nicaea took place others mm -hmm. believe that a recently discovered site um, which is underwater currently on uh, wow. in, in the lake we, yeah. because Iznik, the city of Nicaea was on a lake. Wow, subhanAllah. Okay. okay. So this uh, new newly discovered site uh, was seen uh, from uh, from above. Mm -hmm. there, there's an aerial view. You can actually see the foundations of a religious building and it looks like a church. So a lot of recent scholars believe that that was the spot where the Council of Nicaea actually took place. Okay. Okay, because sources assert that the Council of Nicaea uh, went on for a very long time. It, the, of course, the conclusions were drawn on a particular day, mm -hmm. but uh, the bishops had gathered for nearly a month discussing okay. points of theology, right? And it is possible that these discussions took place in different places, but mm -hmm. uh, there is a part of the council or discussion that took place in Constantine's palace, mm -hmm. okay, in the city of Nicaea or current-day Iznik, Iznik yeah. in Turkey, right? So there are two candidates of this particular council where the council might have taken place. One was where I actually showed a church. It still exists. The church still sta is standing, but it's a masjid now. Oh, it was, okay. it was made into a masjid when Sultan Murad uh, took the city from the Romans. Do you think the Ottomans were aware of the history? I don't think so. Really? I don't think so. I don't think the Ottomans were actually aware of the history of the Council of Nicaea. I don't think so. Okay, mm -hmm. Even most Christians at that time wouldn't be aware of that history. Mm, yeah. Maybe bishops these Roman clergy mm -hmm. when we say Roman we, we mean the the reason why a lot of people a lot of scholars use the term Byzantine is to basically denote the Christian um, element also yeah. right Eastern. so Byzantine yeah, Eastern Roman Empire yeah. was also called the Byzantine Empire yeah. because uh, they became Christian after Constantine yeah. the subsequent emperors were Christian mm -hmm. What version of Christianity did they follow is another very interesting question because not every single one of them was a Trinitarian. Trinitarian. Like Constantius, the son of Constantine who succeeded him, uh, was a Unitarian Christian, Unitarian uh, in, in inverted commas, or uh, some sort of Arian. Okay, He had some Arian tendencies. Uh, he wasn't a unit, uh, Trinitarian in the strict sense of the word. And then Valens was another emperor who was a Unitarian, mm -hmm. then came Theodosius, who basically rubber-stamped the doctrine of the Trinity in the Council of Constantinople in 381 CE. Because there was two councils. Uh, you see, the problem well. is a lot of people don't appreciate and understand how important these places are for Christian history. Mm -hmm. Some of these places, some of these cities taken by the Ottomans from the Romans are basically as important as Mecca and Medina is for Muslims. And these monuments are in Muslim hands today. And they've mm -hmm. survived. So when people talk about Muslims destroying churches, Muslim Muslims destroying religious buildings and all that, it's all it's all a lie. You go to Turkey, mm -hmm. you see the oldest churches in the world are still standing today. It's another thing that they are masjids. They have been made into mosques because these territories were taken by force by the Muslims. And it was a very well understood common tradition 
among uh, uh, forces or, uh, or civilizations fighting each other that if a territory is taken by force, everything within the territory belongs to the, the conquerors. Okay, so they went by this law at yeah. that time. Yeah. Okay, so if the Romans were to take a city, everything in the city would belong to the Romans. And if the Ottomans were to take a city by force, yeah. having fought their way in, everything in the city would belong belong to them. So that's why a lot of these old buildings, churches, were made into mosques, and for that reason, they survived because mm -hmm. they were take they were they were preserved, they were maintained, and they were renovated. So this church this old fourth century church or originally built in the fourth century this church still stands to this day mm -hmm. in the city of iznik and it's it's one of those candidates for the council of nicaea it is highly possible that these 318 uh bishops sat in that particular vicinity and and discussed points of theology that's why i provocative provocatively titled the video uh, the masjid where jesus became god <laughs> so it was in the council of nicaea when uh, it was determined that jesus is god just as god the father yeah on par with him okay equal to god the father another person in the trinity so god true God of true God with capital G, basically. So Jesus was declared to be God with capital G in this council, the Council of Nicaea. You know, a lot of people might be wondering, what do you mean when you say capital G and small g? What does that mean? Small g, biblically speaking, other people were called gods, Okay. the Israelites. That meant people of God, Okay. divine people. Mm -hmm. Okay, God with lowercase g in the ancient world mm -hmm. meant people of God or godly people. Mm -hmm. Okay, so for example, the book of Psalms, chapter 82, verse 6. Okay, it is stated, and this is the Bible, I'm quoting the Bible, that Israelites are gods. Mm -hmm. Okay, with lowercase g. Mm -hmm. That means they are, they are godly people, right? Mm -hmm. Or there is another example in the book of Exodus, chapter 7, verse 1, mm -hmm. where Moses is told that I have made you a god to Pharaoh. Yeah. Okay? Mm -hmm. Like a guide to Pharaoh. Mm -hmm. God with lowercase g, by mm -hmm. the way. But when you write God with capital G, that means God the creator. Yes, yes. There's God the, the, the rub. There's a distinction. God, God the, the supreme... Mm -hmm. uh, Deity. Yes. So Jesus became God with capital G. Okay, in the in the Council of Nicaea. They basically decided right. it. Yeah. So one of the strong, one of the most, uh, how can I put it? One of the most um, sacred points of theology for Christians today was determined in Turkey, mm -hmm. in the city of Iznik. Yes. classically called Nicaea mm -hmm. in that very church or maybe the other church underwater mm -hmm. okay but it was done in the city of Nicaea mm -hmm. that was taken by the Ottomans in the 14th century mm -hmm. to be precise 1326 mm -hmm. when Sultan Murad the first uh, took that city mm -hmm. from the Romans and that was a huge blow to the Romans mm -hmm. it, it's like losing Al-Quds Mm. Okay, because that's a very sacred place for the Christians. Nicaea. Yeah. Right, Nicaea. Then these churches were built in the city of Constantinople where the second council took place, mm -hmm. the Council of Constantinople. That council took place in a church called the Church of St. Irene, mm -hmm. which is basically part of the top copy palace today. Mm -hmm. And it was used by the Ottomans to store their weapons. Mm -hmm. Not knowing the significance, I don't think the Ottomans knew that this is one of the most important churches in Christian history, the Church of Saint Irene. It's possible they knew, okay. but they didn't care. Uh, <laughs> I don't think, think so. <laughs> I don't think Ottomans were aware of that history, mm. uh, or even if I don't know, I don't think they were interested in that history yeah, yeah. to begin with, yeah. because they they were more uh, focused on expanding their territory yeah, and taking yeah. all this land. Yeah. And, you know, I really want to talk about the, the, the achievements. Ottomans took Islam 
militarily speaking, into Europe. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they were facing crusades. Mm -hmm. Crusaders, European, Western European crusaders fought them. Mm -hmm. Crusaders came from France and Britain to fight the Ottomans. Can mm -hmm. you believe it? Yeah. In the Balkans. Wow. Right? So there were many famous battles that took place between Ottoman sultans. In fact, one of the Ottoman sultans was killed on battle uh, on the battlefield. Mm -hmm. After having won the battle in 1389, the Battle of Kosovo, Sultan Murad was assassinated soon after the battle. So, so this sultan was basically... Sultan Murad I was... He was killed on battle. Killed right after the battle. Right after the... The Battle of Kosovo fought in 1389 was uh, a very important battle that took place between... Uh, the Ottomans and the Serbians. Mm -hmm. So Serbia basically became Ottoman territory, much of Serbia, okay, after this battle. Okay. So before that, Sultan Uthman, Ghazi Uthman, who was the son of Ertogrul. By the way, this Ertogrul series is mostly fictional. Okay. A lot of people don't know this. Mm -hmm. Okay. They think it truly represents the beginning of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, I don't think that is the case. Um, Actually, I know that's not the case because we don't <laughs> we don't know anything about Ertogrul. Very, very little, very little is known about Ertogrul. In fact, the only physical evidence we have of Ertogrul Ghazi is a coin mm -hmm. uh, attributed to Uthman Ghazi, his son, mm -hmm. which basically states the name of Uthman bin uh, Sultan Uthman, the son of Ertogrul. That's the only physical mention we have. That's why I don't. Artogru. That's why I don't really watch these series. But it's, it's good like to watch. You know, those people who watch them for a cultural understanding of the period, mm -hmm. or maybe historic outline of main events, then it's it's not a problem. But uh, there's going to be a lot of stuff in there where you might start to think this is actual history when it's not. No, it's not history. Yeah. Artogru, the series is not history. That's, that's uh, the thing. It's, it's fiction. Historic fiction, I would say. Yeah. It's, it's, it's fiction based in history. Yeah. Okay. So, Ghazi Uthman was his son, and very little is known about him as well. Okay. History writing about the Ottomans starts to take place when Sultan Murad, the son of Sultan Uthman, uh, Sultan Orhan, sorry, not Murad, Sultan Orhan, the son of Sultan Uthman, mm -hmm. uh, came, comes to power and he starts to take more and more territory. Mm -hmm. After Sultan Orhan comes Sultan Murad, mm -hmm. Murad the first, who died soon after the Battle of Kosovo. How, do you do you remember how he was killed? Like how did he? he was, how did there he are die? there are differing there, there there are differing reports about uh, his assassination. Uh, Christian sources claim that uh, it was one of the Serbian Serbian prisoners who pretended to surrender. Ah, uh, uh, okay. And when he was brought close to the sultan, or when he came, when he came close to the sultan, he stabbed him in the neck mm. and in the stomach. Okay. okay. Then the Muslim sources highlight that he was killed soon after the battle. Okay. Uh, and he was killed by one of the assassins. Okay. Doesn't okay. It, the Muslim sources don't clarify? But the European Europeans celebrated this yeah. all the way, all the way to England. Yeah. yeah. Even in Britain. Celebrations took place when this news reached that the Ottoman Sultan uh, has been assassinated after the Battle of Kosovo. Mm -hmm. And many people claimed that this was a victory because the Sultan was killed. But his son, uh, Bayezid the Thunderbolt, also known as Bayezid Yeldrum. Yeldrum actually means the Thunderbolt. He was given this title, this name, because of his speed. So when Sultan... Murad the first's son Bayezid Yeldrum took uh, took power. He completely <laughs> devastated and overwhelmed the Serbs, and it took a lot more territory in Serbia. Yeah. So he became a very worthy uh, successor. In fact, he besieged Constantinople for nearly eight years. Wow! For nearly eight years, it's when Temur from Central Asia decided to invade the Ottoman territory. Mm -hmm. So Temur basically rescued the city of Constantinople. Mm -hmm. I believe the city of Constantinople would have been taken by Sultan Bayezid 50 years earlier. Mm -hmm. 50 years earlier if Temur did not mm -hmm. intervene. So Temur or Temelain, Temur the Lame mm -hmm. or Temur Lang mm -hmm. as he's called in Persian, mm -hmm. 
he was another Genghis Khan to mm-hmm. simplify things. His mm-hmm. basically, you know, idea was that mm-hmm. I want to revive the legacy of Genghis Khan. I want to take as much territory, if not more, mm-hmm. as did Genghis Khan. Mm-hmm. So Timur was trying to imitate his hero, mm-hmm. Genghis Khan, mm-hmm. right? So he went conquering all over the place. Mm-hmm. He, he he conquered all those lands that were taken by the Mongols, right? Yeah. Or reconquered, let's say. He even went as far as India. Mm-hmm. He devastated the city of Delhi in 1398. Then he went to Damascus. Mm-hmm. Okay. He met Ibn Khaldun, wow. the famous scholar Ibn Khaldun. So was right? he... Was he... You know, because the Mongols, for example, like when, um, you know, at Khwarezm Shah, Muhammad Khwarezm Shah's time, hmm. when when he was dealing with the Mongols and stuff, they were quite immoral. And um, the historian... The uh, Mongols? Yeah, they were... Uh, Ibn al-Athir speaks about this. Ibn yeah, al-Athir. Yeah. M- Mongols were very brutal. He speaks yeah. about how immoral they were, uh, meaning like they would, they would agree to a peace treaty. Yeah. And then go against the peace yeah. treaty. You know, yeah. for example, yeah. they would say to the people of the city... You're all good, no problem. Surrender. Surrender. And then people would, would surrender, and yeah. then they would massacre them, mm-hmm. right? So was Temur like that? Yeah, Temur was. Uh, he was like that as well. Temur would actually make a point of punishing people, okay, making an example out of them if they resisted. Okay. The only exception he made was the city of Damascus, okay, because the city of Damascus was very, very bravely defended. Mm-hmm. So when he took the city of Damascus, he excused all the people because he he admired the. Mm-hmm. the brilliance in defending the city and even Ibn Khuldun came to plead with him you know please leave the city alone mm-hmm. don't kill them so that was a historic meeting wow. same Timur decided to attack Anatolia mm-hmm. okay and Ottomans by this time when Sultan Bayezid Jaldaram is in power had taken a lot more land in Anatolia in when Asia was this Minor. sorry to interrupt this is 1402 okay to be precise, this is the year 1402. So this is well before Constantinople has yeah, been the con- conquered the city of by... Uh, Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, yeah. one of the grandsons of this Sultan This is nearly a hundred years before that, yeah, over a hundred yeah. years before Re- that. Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih was the great grandson of Sultan Bayezid Jaldaram. Mm-hmm. So he would take the city 50 years later. Was it? Oh yeah, 1453. 1453. Sorry, yeah, yeah. 1453, so, yeah. Sultan Bayezid yeah. Jaldaram was besieging the city of Constantinople when Timur attacked him mm-hmm. from behind him. Uh, so Eastern Anatolia was touching the borders of Central Asia, you can say. So mm-hmm. Timur came in, yes. attacking his territory. So there was this Battle of Ankara. Mm-hmm. It's called the Battle of Ankara. Mm-hmm. It is the most devastating battle in the history of the Ottomans because the Ottoman Empire almost crumbled. Mm-hmm. Just, uh, just as it started mm-hmm. nearly 100 years ago, it crumbled. Mm-hmm. It almost crumbled mm-hmm. because Timur completely devastated... Uh, the Ottomans, okay, in this battle. Yes. Sultan Bayezid was captured, mm-hmm. okay, and he was humiliated. There are reports mm-hmm. that Timur put him in a cage mm-hmm. and uh, paraded him all over the place and uh, humiliated him. There are other reports from the Timurid side that he was treated respectfully. Again, these are conflicting reports about his treatment. But he eventually died within a year. Sultan Bayezid Jaldaram died in captivity, right? Mm-hmm. His sons fought each other for the throne Mm -hmm. and then followed uh, more than 10 years of extreme struggle uh, of succession between the sons of Sultan Bayezid. This is why scholars believe that it was a miracle as to uh, how the Ottoman Empire or the Ottoman state survived Mm -hmm. because these sons having fought each other it was completely so devastated unstable uh, un- unstable unstable because they took different cities mm-hmm. and different principalities each son controlled a major uh, outpost of the ottoman territory mm-hmm. and they used it and they allied themselves with the byzantines the romans actually got involved and the romans were taking full advantage of this divide and they completely wanted to wipe out the ottomans mm-hmm. uh, because they felt very threatened Sultan Bayezid was on the verge of taking the city of Constantinople mm-hmm. when Timur attacked him. Yes. So the Romans saw Timur as a savior. If the guy's besieging it for eight years. Yeah, imagine. <laughs> yeah. So so these sons of so Sultan Bayezid. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So they fought each other. Yeah. They were Suleiman, Musa, Isa, Mustafa, uh, Muhammad Chalabi, the one who came out 
to be the sultan the next mm-hmm. sultan who defeated all his brothers so he's called muhammad chalabi mm-hmm. okay sultan muhammad the first in other words you so know he united the ottomans and he re-established the ottoman state and then lo and behold the ottomans survived you know the ottomans they did have people of knowledge amongst them of course right, of course of course many so are, hmm. so what do you think these people of knowledge were advising these sons when they were fighting each other because I, I i'm not i'm i do understand that there's people do ask the question how can uh, muslim leaders sons fight each other brothers fight each other etc but i do understand that a lot of the time uh, we fall into um an issue where we look at history from our lens we spoken about this in the last yeah. episode actually yeah so i do understand that okay they had their own context they had their own you know Situation. they had to do what mm. they had to do basically and whatever mm. but what was the religious advice like what do you what do you think look it varied from sultan to sultan from place to place from period to period so it wasn't homogeneous you will not find one uh you know volume of fatawa or religious rulings give, given by uh, ulama during mm-hmm. the ottoman period because this was 600 years this period was vast Mm-hmm. A lot happened in these 600 years. A lot of things changed. And the ulama n- never mm-hmm. agreed with each other fully. Okay, mm-hmm. So if one set of ulama are giving one fatwa to a sultan, another set of ulama would come later and possibly challenge it. So do you think okay. some of the ulama at the time were, reli- were religiously kind of justifying 100%. the person they were? Ulama, ulama throughout the Ottoman history were directly involved in politics. Mm-hmm. The Ottomans... had divided the state into uh three categories mm-hmm. okay uh, for example askariya mm-hmm. which was military then ilmiya mm-hmm. which was knowledge knowledge wise okay, yeah. knowledge wise the ulama and uh, the governors and even the wazirs mm-hmm. they came under ilmiya mm-hmm. and uh, uh, executive okay mm-hmm. i don't know what the, what the term was for that uh, so there was the the executive uh, mm-hmm. uh, side of the state mm-hmm. which was the sultan and his uh, establishment yes. okay so 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 in other words the sultan the military and the ulama mm-hmm. these were the three entities that ruled uh, in collaboration so, the ottoman state so i'm wondering for, that the yeah. the ilmi side they they mm-hmm. probably did feel like it, they probably did have their own look their problems yeah. were not like our problems yeah, yeah. it's not a fight between two brothers living in the same house no yeah, yeah these are princes who were independent they had their own militaries mm-hmm. they had their own establishments they had their own staff they had their own territories mm-hmm. they had their own provinces right so they are rulers of different territories yes. they were very powerful people mm-hmm. they hardly met with each other yes. they weren't like they didn't have a relationship with like we do today like we sit with brothers our blood brothers our siblings we mm-hmm. talk to them we build relationships with them but they weren't like this and they often came from different mothers mm-hmm. they had different agendas mm-hmm. they had different uh, ambitions and aspirations mm-hmm. so we cannot judge ottoman princes or mogul princes for that matter or seljuk princes for that matter by a normal standard person's lens no they were not normal people they were not standard ordinary people they were living very different lives living very different realities so this this is something you have to understand when people start to judge princes or sultans let's say uh, by our own uh, standard today our moral values let's say our ethics of the 21st century this in the study of history uh, is called anachronism anachronism is basically when you apply a later standard to judge an earlier age okay those people lived different realities their circumstances were different they had to face different challenges to us that's why they think they, they did things differently yeah they didn't follow our laws our ethics our feelings our sentiments they didn't feel like us mm-hmm. they didn't talk like us they didn't even think like us right they they, they were thinking very differently yeah. so these are the things we have to think about mm-hmm. so when we talk about the, even the ulama they, those ulama were not dealing with situations ulama the ulama deal with today Mm-hmm. Okay, so though they were living a, a, a very different reality, mm-hmm. and of course these rulers often used ulama to justify their 
wars, mm-hmm. the invasions, because the Ottomans were not only fighting the Romans. But, that yeah. was no one. None mm-hmm. of the Muslim states in Anatolia, in Asia Minor, mm-hmm. none of those Turkic beyliks had a problem with that because the Ottomans were doing the job of Islam. Yeah. Okay, as far as they were concerned, the Ottomans were fighting jihad against the Romans, mm-hmm. right? But when the Ottomans turned to other beyliks mm-hmm. to fight them, to subdue them, this is when. Uh, this became a problem because oh, mm-hmm. you're attacking now other Muslim brothers. You're attacking Muslim principalities. Why are you doing this? So the ulama had to justify. The ulama did justify that these guys, because they're stronger, uh, they are uh, more worthy of ruling. And if anyone's attacking them from behind them, then uh, they are justified in attacking them in retaliation. Okay. So these kind of things did take place. Okay. So... Uh, Ottoman history is so fascinating. We can be mm-hmm. talking. We could be talking for for hours upon hours. But I really want everyone to understand. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think I think to be honest, with you, this has been a taster. Mm-hmm. Um, we can have more episodes. We can have. I think what we should do in the future is we can have some individual episodes on specific parts. Maybe. Um. So we could do a whole episode on Ottoman Muhammad Fatih. Yeah. For example, Absolutely. do a whole episode on yeah. the conquest uh, of. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the conquering of Constantinople, yeah, um, and we, we we could do all of that. We could do individual episodes. And stuff. I think this is this is Inshallah. the this is the highlight of this podcast. Conversation can go anywhere. Yeah, it yeah, is not for controlled, sure. as we explained in the first uh, episode. Yeah. That these are going to be random conversations on history, on mm-hmm. current events, on anything interesting for mm-hmm. that matter. Your mm-hmm. questions. We want you to ask questions. By the way, yeah. So is is this book a good book? Yeah, Osman's Dream is a very good book. Uh, is it's by Caroline Finkel. Does it's that good. cover um, all of it? Pretty much. Uh, it's a very good, uh, I would say, it's a very good treatment of Ottoman history. And okay. it, even that book is brief. As big as it may look, but it's a brief treatment of the Ottoman history of 600 years. Wow, okay. Yeah, yeah it's a very good book, I would say. Mm-hmm. It's quite technical at places. Um, In From a from a historical perspective? Uh well, if, if, you, if you don't know the background, uh, okay. uh, some terminologies, uh, you know, you the, she assumes, the author, Caroline Finkel, she assumes that people would be aware of those basic terminologies. Like, like what? Like, uh, you know, the Seljuks. Who are the Seljuks? Oh, fine. For example, okay, okay, people, okay. Uh, or historic realities or dynasties or names of the sultans and things like that. Mm, right? Okay. So sometimes you... you, you Go if, do if your own research. If this is the first book you're reading on the, on the Ottomans, then you may you may be confused at places, right? Mm-hmm. But it's a very good treatment. Osman's Dream. It's called Osman's Dream. And the author is Caroline Finkel. Mm-hmm. Okay. I think we've gone on for yeah, a yeah. very long time. We'll leave and it at that, we should, I think. We should summarize this. I, I hope you enjoyed our discussion on the Ottomans. Uh, the, my memory was fresh. Uh, I just came back from Turkey having done this history tour. Watch out for more of these tours of Turkey, Ottoman Turkey, and Al-Andalus, Islamic Spain, and more, inshallah ta'ala. Keep an eye on our social media accounts. Uh, there is... Um, Another uh, tour coming from the 24th of July to the 29th of July, 2023. This July, basically, you you are most welcome to join us on this tour of Al-Andalus, Spain. I will be the history guide on that tour, inshallah. And you can get some personal history teaching from me while you are there on the tour. We can have conversations like we did in Turkey. And uh, do look look into it. Uh, you check out my social media accounts, my YouTube posts, and you will see the post up there for more details, inshallah ta'ala. On that note, uh, we want you to ask questions. And if you have questions, please post them in the comments section. Mm-hmm. Post them very briefly. Don't write long essays because we're not going to be able to uh, treat them. So keep your questions as brief as possible. Keep them straight to the point, whether those questions are history-related, theology-related, current events-related. We will try our best to uh, make this podcast as dynamic as possible. And inshallah, in the next podcast, we will announce the name. We have received many recommendations. Thank you so much, everyone. We have been overwhelmed by your, your recommendations. And we've been we've been looking at every single one of them. None of them were ignored. Amazing recommendations, but we haven't yet 
decided what we are going to call this podcast, but it will be announced soon. Currently, the working name is the Father and Son Podcast, and most of us <laughs> saying that it may, it it may, it might, it might, it might as stay, well, might, just might as well, we, we might as let's well. Let's see, it let's that. see what we do. Okay, so Inshallah. currently it's the Father and Son, right? Yeah. So it's a conversation between the Father and Son on history, current events, and other interesting things. Inshallah. Ta'ala. Inshallah. Brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah khairan for listening to this episode. Do subscribe, inshallah, and keep up to date with all of the content. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.